Lyric. How old is Lyric now? Almost three. Take Lyric and Ember and Ariah together. It looks like she had twins over three years. Triplets, actually. Triplets. Uh, it's amazing how much those children look alike. Praying for Matt's surgery in the morning. They had a sitter lined up that fell through to, to watch who? Uh, Lyric and Ember. Is that who you need a sitter for? Lyric and Ember. Uh, and then Ashley's planning to take him. So if we need to shuffle some things around where someone else takes him so that she can stay with the kids, or if you want to uh, stay with those precious little kids, just uh, let us know quickly after the service so we can, we can nail that down for tomorrow. 1 Corinthians 15, we are looking at this wonderful passage as we come close to the end of our study through 1 Corinthians, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. It is 58 verses, chapter 15 is, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've already introduced it to you. We've looked at it. This is our fourth look today. Rich, the heart of the gospel. Without it, without the physical, bodily, time and space resurrection of Jesus Christ from the tomb, we are playing games here today, folks. But as Paul is going to say, and as we are absolutely convinced, but now Christ is risen from the grave. We looked last week at the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Today we're going to hear Paul's testimony. We read the story of his conversion. We're going to hear something of his testimony today. If you found 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11, stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read these verses. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What if we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord help us today as, as we hear Paul's story to ask ourselves the question have i by grace been untimely born into the kingdom of god thank you please be seated well we told you that this chapter breaks down actually the first 11 verses break down and the testimony of the church the testimony of the scriptures the old testament prophecies foretelling this, the testimony of the eyewitnesses we looked at last week, the testimony of the Apostle Paul himself, and then the common message of the gospel. He has cited historical instances of eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from death to life. And in fact, he says 500. This was 20 years after this now when he writes this. 500, most of whom are still alive today. The implication is if you wanted to go talk to these people who were gathered 500 strong and met with him, we suggested last week probably a worship service which, which had to... Can, can you imagine the difference between worshiping with Jesus, these folks, before the resurrection and after the resurrection? There were crowds that gathered to hear him. He taught 
Can you imagine being there, though? Particularly if you're, if you're the band of followers, the, the apostles, the women who saw Him crucified. And then a gathering of 500 after He's risen from the grave. I would love to have been at that worship service. I don't think you could have kept him quiet as he's teaching. Going through the Old Testament, say, you see that? That was talking about me. You can just hear, you can hear the, the hallelujahs rising. Yes, thank you. Just, just bursting into joyful praise. And so these, most of these people were still alive 20 years later. Paul says, you can check it out yourself. And he says, Verse 8, last of all, not the last time Jesus has encountered someone savingly, because we're going to talk about us here in a few minutes, but the last of Paul's evidences to the resurrection, the infallible declaration that Jesus Christ is risen. He cites his own experience. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And then he, he acknowledges, because see, he wasn't one of the original 12. He had not been with Jesus during the three years of Jesus' public ministry. Fact of the matter, he was being schooled by Gamaliel at the same time that that Peter, James, John, and the twelve were being schooled by Jesus. He was getting the reports given to the Sanhedrin about this rabbi who did not originate from us, who's not one of us, who's never sought our counsel, who's going around stirring up mischief. He was getting those reports. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. He wasn't even among the 500 brethren who gathered after the resurrection. He said, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. When we read Acts 9 a while ago, that's on the heels of the previous chapters which tell us about Saul, one of the leading uh, upcoming Pharisees standing and taking charge and having oversight of the stoning to death of Stephen, one of, the, one of those deacons chosen by the church to handle some of the challenges it was facing. Saul was there giving consent to this. They laid their garments by Saul. And we read in Acts 9 that he'd been given letters. In fact, he asked for them. Would you write authoritative letters to the synagogue so that I can go to Damascus? I will demonstrate, I'll show to the leaders in the synagogues, I'm here on the authority of the Sanhedrin to put down this uprising that they called at that time the way, taken from Jesus' teaching when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he was doing on the way to Damascus. But he says in verse 10, but by the grace of God I am what I am. Implying there I'm not what I was. By the way, that's what grace does. When you receive the grace of God, you're, you're not any longer what you were. Now, yeah, you're still struggling with, with sin and uh, sinful habits and, and things like that, undergoing sanctification. But you have a new nature. Peter said you've been made partakers of the divine nature when you're saved given the grace of God. He says his grace toward me was not in vain. As he said in, in the early verses of, of chapter 15, unless you believed in vain, he's, he's challenging the Corinthians there, that if, if it was just a head, just a notional idea, if you just got caught up in the emotion in Corinth of people being swept into the kingdom and you, wanted, you, you thought it was exciting, wanted to be a part of that, or it seemed reasonable to you, all of that would be vain if it's not a true heart transformation, not an inside-out experience. He says, his grace toward me was not in vain. Well, if anybody had any question about that, 
Just look at the man who had letters, had letters in hand to stamp out the way in Damascus, who ends up in the synagogues for sure. Why don't you put yourself there? Use a little sanctified imagination. You're a rabbinic leader. You're, you're part of the leadership. You're part of that little synagogues. And Saul shows up. Apparently this was common knowledge. And Ananias knew what he was coming to do. He said, we, Lord, we, we've heard. I mean, this, man's, this man's been coming after your church. We've heard he's coming here to do the same thing. And Ananias knew about it. The people in the synagogues where he ended up going, not to introduce himself to get their blessing, their imprimatur, their, their intel, if you please, about where these followers of the way might be found. He comes in and he says, uh, by the way, I get the, they're standing there saying, I understand you have letters. By the way, you need to know, Jesus is the Christ. <laughs> We thought you were coming here to stamp out that message. No, I'm, I'm here by grace to put a stamp of the truth of that message and testify to a transformation. Powerful. Now, what he says here, this, this term that he uses, one born out of season it's a it's an interesting word untimely born uh, it's a word that ordinarily referred to abortion or miscarriage or premature birth think about what Paul is saying here Paul is saying you know I I thought I mean this is this is this is Saul in full Pharisee garb, probably had the phylacteries attached to his headgear, probably had the phylacteries bound on his hands. He, he was, a, in fact, he says that, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Other Pharisees may have dressed up, but when I dressed up, you knew I was a Pharisee. I was alive but alive for the wrong thing. It took something equivalent to an abortion. God aborted a full-grown, proud, angry Pharisee. There was something like a miscarriage Performed and then God brought to life that which He killed. You think that's strong language? It's the word Paul uses here. One writer said, I think it was John MacArthur said, "You may be indicating the hopelessness for life without divine intervention, conveying the idea that he was born without hope of meeting Christ." Christ was already crucified. The rumor was that he'd been raised. Paul didn't believe that rumor. So Paul says, when he, when he, when he stopped me on Damascus, what he did to me was, was not the same, all the, the results the same, but not in the same way that he did to the disciples where he nurtured them and and Peter would confess at Caesarea Philippi, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus would say, Simon, you did not figure that out on your own. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Simon, you, you're on the receiving end of a supernatural revelation that no mere human being could have figured out for himself. Simon came to have his eyes opened having followed Jesus around, as John said in John's Gospel. And we beheld his glory. We studied this one. Came to the supernatural conclusion that this, the only way you explain the glory, the Shekinah upon this one Jesus of Nazareth is that he's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They came to the supernatural revelation 
through the, through the intentional study of the person and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Not Saul. Saul knows all he wants to know about it. All he knows is that there's this Jewish rabbi, uh, history's seen them from time to time, who is claiming to be the Messiah. He's gathering followers to himself. He's making the Sanhedrin look bad. He needs to be stopped. Saul's mind, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified and rumored to be raised from the dead, is a blasphemer and needs to be silenced. His followers do. And then this intervention on the Damascus Road. An ill-timed birth. Too late to have been one of the twelve. An unformed, dead, useless life. The Pharisee of the Pharisee. Hebrew of the Hebrew. Tribe of Benjamin. Top student of Gamaliel. Handpicked to stamp out Christianity. That existence, like an unformed, dead, useless life. He tells his story different ways. If you think about another angle on this, Romans 7, verses 7 to 13, when Paul says, what shall we say then? As he's arguing for sin and the nature of the law and the need of grace, what shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. You've got you to understand what he's talking about here. He's describing his conversion here. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. What he's saying here is the idea of coveting would not have been something I would have taken in as, a, as an uninformed Jew had I not encountered the Tenth Commandment, and all the whole body of the Ten Commandments. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, you shall not covet, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. What was Paul, what was Paul covetous for? Well, we don't know everything, but we know that in the context of what he's talking about there, he was covetous for the name of the Sanhedrin. He was covetous for the reputation of the Jewish leadership, that they and they only were the depository of truth. He was covetous, wrongfully, but he was covetous for the name of Yahweh, who he understood to be being blasphemed by Jesus of Nazareth and now Jesus' followers. Produced in me all kinds of covetousness. I think this is what he comes to see on the road to Damascus. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Saul had memorized the Ten Commandments. In fact, if he's a Pharisee, Saul has memorized the entire Tanakh. The five books of Moses. The wisdom literature. The historical books. And the prophets. I want you to chew on that for just a couple of seconds here. You might have all sorts of marks of promise, but you don't enter the ranks of the Pharisees unless you can respond in memory to what you and I understand to be the Old Testament. So he knew it. He knew that you shall not covet was Exodus 20, verse 17. But he viewed that from the standpoint of one who was, who was in good standing to the Ten Commandments. Remember the rich young ruler? 
Good teacher, what must I do? What good thing must I do to uh, inherit eternal life or enter, enter heaven? Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. But since you've asked, you know the law. He said, oh, I've, kept, I've kept the law since my youth. I mean, surely, is that all there is, or is there something else I've left out? Jesus said, well, since, you're, since you've mastered the law, go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have riches in heaven. Go back and we've looked at that passage several times over the years. You go back and look at it again. Jesus cited several of the Ten Commandments. But one of the Ten Commandments he did not cite was which one? The Tenth Commandment. Shall not covet. So he challenged him. The man was a covetous man. He had great possessions and he didn't want to turn loose of them. Not even for the prospect of kingdom riches. So... Paul in Romans 7 says, apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. Now, he's, you know he's not saying here, I was alive apart from the knowledge of the law. There are a lot of people like that. You live around people like that who have no idea what the, what the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which is the summary of the law of God. They have no idea what it says. And if you share them with them, they laugh at you. Oh, that's old stuff. But he says he was alive apart from the law once. But when the commandment came, when did it come? I promise you there were many times in this young man's life when the commandment came out of his mouth when he would cite it. Recite it. On the road to Damascus, when the blinding light came that struck him and his companion with awe and terror, and this voice from heaven who knows him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, a good Pharisee, who would have told you when he was mounting his steed to leave for Damascus, if you'd ask him, Saul, do you know? And they wouldn't have said Yahweh because that name was forbidden to be spoken except on the Day of Atonement. Do you know Adonai? He said, oh, Adonai. Blessed, blessed be the name of Adonai. I've lived my life devoted to Adonai. I'm going now in the name of Adonai. Well, why are you persecuting me? He, his response is, who are you? Who are you, Lord? Who am I persecuting? Why are, you, why are you saying this to me? I'm Jesus. Whom you're persecuting. The commandment came. Just as the prophet under the inspiration of God, said to David, you are the man. What Saul got. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. He was found guilty. I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive. It isn't that he began to sin, it's that he came to realize that as he lived, as surely as he lived, he lived as a sinner under the condemnation of God. And I died. I was aborted that day. I was miscarried that day. I was brought to be undone that day. The very commandment that promised life. Do this and live. That's how he grew up. Keep the law and live. The very commandment that he thought by keeping it would give him life was the commandment that brought him to death. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. 
So the law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? In other words, ultimate death, final death, death with nothing following by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might come, might become sinful beyond measure. Paul, who was Saul on the road to Damascus, faced the utter sinfulness of his own sin, his deserving condemnation. The one who was on the road to go condemn followers of the way faced the reality that he himself was under the condemnation of God and that what he was doing was despicable to God, that he was tracking down, going to bring these folks bound back to Jerusalem so they could, they could face the same final moments that Stephen had faced, stoning to death under the auspices of the Jewish religious leaders. Saul, Damascus Road, realized, I'm the one who deserves to be executed. I'm the one under the judgment of God. I persecuted the church of God. Listen to what he what he says in 1 Timothy 1, 12-17, I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. Though I formerly was, was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of God, of our Lord, overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deceiving, deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, Saul leaving for Damascus did not know himself or see himself as a sinner. But on the road to Damascus, he came face to face. He was a sinner. And he learned almost as quickly. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Saul who became Paul, understood that he had sinned against great light. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Oh, but pastor, God could never save me. If you, if you knew my life, if you know how I've spurned my life, I have, I have wasted, I have opportunities thrown this. Friend, if God was pleased to save someone whose mission in life was to kill people who call upon the name of Jesus, then there's hope for you. There's life for a look at the Savior. There's life abundant and free if you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in the face of the Christ who died and rose again. He says to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. That's the kind of gospel you have? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, part of our problem, some of us forget what great sinners we were. I read this passage and I tremble when I read it. Because had God condemned me to hell where I deserved to go as a little boy and heading into teen years, moving toward adulthood, full of all sorts of knowledge, a head full of scriptures, I'd have landed in the hottest hell there is. I didn't think I was a very bad sinner. We forget what great sinners we were when we were saved. So Paul would go on to talk about his, when he says, I labored more than the rest of them. Why would he say, isn't that boastful? No, look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. He's mocking here the super apostles, those, those Judaizer types who came in behind him into Corinth and were putting him down and casting aspersion on him and saying, you know, uh, we've, got, we've got the real message. Paul's, Paul's a fraud. 
He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm, I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. He's not as far greater labors, far more imprisonment, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. I read that and I wonder how many times would it have taken the Jews to beat me 39 times before I said, that's enough. One time's enough. I can, I'll just be a follower of Jesus silently. He experienced that the first time and four more times after that. Forty lashes, we've told you. They believed, the Romans believed, the Jews believed that if you dealt 40 lashes out to someone, it would kill them. So 40 minus 1 was the formula. Beat him nearly to death five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. If he makes that distinction, then that means that the 40 minus 1 in the previous verse was the cat of nine tails. Once I was stoned. Thought about that? Him standing before a crowd to stone him to death. You think, you think his mind went back, flashed back to standing, consenting to the death of Stephen being stoned to death? Three times I was shipwrecked. We know of one recorded in Acts. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things. <laughs> Put all those things aside. I don't know how you do that. There's the daily pressure, the squeezing of my anxiety for all the churches. I don't, there's not a day that goes by that I don't. When I leave a town and go on to the next one to plant a church or go back to visit a church that I don't carry in my heart, oh, how I long for Christ to be formed. People. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to fall and I, I'm not indignant? I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever knows that I'm not lying. At Damascus, I had a special place for him. The governor under King Art Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. See, I worked harder than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Anything you see, he says, of, of, of a tenacity, of a determination, what F.F. F. Bruce calls Paul's magnificent obsession was to know Christ and be known by him, to be conformed to the image of Christ, that when he encountered people, what they didn't understand about Jesus Christ, they would come to understand as they saw his life, his commitment, the transformation. He wasn't boasting in his spirituality. He was boasting in the amazing grace of God shown to him. And he says, verse 11, concerning the common message, whether then it was I or they, so we preach. So you believed. I've got to ask you this as we close. Is that what you believed? Well, you may not have been knocked down into the dust with a blinding light on a Damascus road, but you don't have to. Because the question comes to you, to your conscience from the Word of God, why are you persecuting me? Why are you ignoring me? Why do you find things, time for things in life, everything else but me? Why do you spurn my goodness? Why do you spurn my grace? Why do you spurn my love? Why? He's still asking that question today. And we who are followers of Christ, he may come to us, prick our conscience and say, Bill, why do you lose your zeal for me? Bill, why do you get distracted from my mission? Bill, why do you act like 
My love is something to be taken for granted. Why do you find the ability to, to comfort your head like a, on a pillow with my love, but not, not stirred up and, and provoked to take that to people within your sphere of influence who don't even think of me? Or when they do, they think ill of me? Why? Why? Why do you ignore me? Why do you love others more than me? We will never be one of the twelve. We weren't there. But oh, if you're saved here today, you were born again in an untimely way. But you were born again for such a time as this. To spend and be spent for Him. That's what the resurrection does. When it moves from an idea to a heart-gripping reality. When the resurrected King not only has resurrected you, but is resurrecting you daily, that power of the resurrection in your life. That's what Paul would teach us today. Last week we saw tender mercies of Jesus to single out Peter to make sure Peter understood he hadn't sinned away the day of grace. Today the question comes. You've got to ask yourself that. How have I answered? How have I answered? And has, has my direction in my life, has the energy in my life changed or diminished since I said, Lord, you're my Lord. I repent. I've come face to face with my sin, with my, my deserving condemnation, my reality that I should have been cast into hell. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. So Lord, forgive me. When I live long enough to yawn at your grace, forgive me. Karen and I read uh, Paul David Tripp's New Morning Mercies. Reading this morning, he was talking about promising his children a trip to Disney World, Walt Disney World. They planned for it for a year, and they got all excited. And when they would get weary of putting their money aside and doing things as a family to get ready for the trip, he would take them back to the web page and show them Walt Disney World again. And finally, the day came, and they got in their vehicle, and they headed toward Orlando or Kissimmee, really, where it is. And, and on the way, they, came, they found a sign, Walt Disney World, 120 miles. And he pulled off. He said, what if I did this now? If I pulled off by the sign and got out and said, we're going to have our vacation. His point is that the sign, not the reality. Too many people who settle for the signs about Jesus who miss the reality. Only, only coming to know Christ will ever satisfy you. You can't know enough about Him to satisfy you. Only coming to know Him, have a relationship with Him, encountering the living Christ on the other side of the crucifixion and resurrection. And in Paul's case, the ascension. Only that will satisfy you. Is that your story today? Is that your story? Don't make the mistake of living life by the sign coming up short of experiencing the reality. Saul was doing that. God graciously arrested him, transformed him. Lived the rest of his life declaring the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Is that what you and I are about? The days draw near. I pray that it will be so.
Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, oh, there's only one message. He died and rose again according to the Scriptures. And then we have the blessed privilege by grace through faith of adding to that. And that has made all the difference in my life. This is my story. This is my song. Help us. To live praising our Savior all day long and sharing with others in the way. They're pretending when they could make the journey by grace through faith to come to know Christ and experience the reality unlike any other reality. Hear us, Lord. Change us, Lord. For your glory, for the name of Jesus, for the sake of our own souls, for the advance of the gospel, for we ask it in Jesus' name.